Thank you so much. We have a, a slight deviation from the rest of the track, because we usually like to do that. We have our own Slido with a couple of questions. You might want to scan that now, because uh, it's also a nice kind of interaction, although we can do shout-outs now that we're in real life again. But it's a nice visualization as well to have in there. Um, that's about it for the start. I'll leave that on there for a couple of seconds more. But, um, by the way, never mind the slides and try to write it down. Some of them are very, very dense in text. Um, so they're already on SlideShare. We'll share the link at the last slide. We want to start with a little bit of history. Um, Michael found this uh, tweet from Alistair Coburn where he just shared the, um, I, like the, the documents that they had for a conference that they were doing in 2001. And we kind of all know what happened in Snowbird because some of us enjoy it and some of us suffer from it. So it was about this uh, conference that was talking or that was creating that what we know as Agile today. And when they started, this was like a conference about uh, lightweight methods. That's what it was about. Uh, and when you take a look at the notes that they, those guys have taken um, to get an idea, okay, what do we actually want to talk about? They had like a whole bunch of stuff in there, and it's really hard to read, but um, a lot of that stuff is about lightweight methods and lightweight processes. And yeah, you see that it was so lightweight, they even took only abbreviations for that one, so it's just LWM. So that was what, what it's all about. Of course, having been around at the time, it makes us cringe a little if people nowadays say, well, you know, agile, you know, the, those agile methods are so heavyweight and you have so much material on that, like a couple of hundred pages description on how to do stuff when it originally was meant to be lightweight and just got a new name. And by making them leaner, we just refer to coming back to what also influenced a lot of the stuff in the Agile community, and that's uh, what came to be known as Lean, when two guys translated the original works of Teichi Ono, which were called the Toyota Production System, and the name Lean was actually introduced in the translation. It wasn't there in the first place. And, well, there's a lot of stuff been lost in translation. I don't know if any of you know Japanese. I know a little bit, and I learned that it's quite hard to not mistranslate it. And for Germany, of, <coughs> happily, there's someone who did a retranslation of the original works, um, Marie Fourcal Kaspari, and we're leaning heavily on that to argument our points, makes it much easier than to find out all those uh, detailed articles on the internet. So if you're German, it's a reading suggestion, and we're still trying to convince people to try to translate the book. So, uh, since Lean is kind of awesome, we kind of want to know what's your understanding about it. So, maybe give us... Oh, you already started. <laughs> nice. So, just give us uh, some ideas of what do you associate with Lean? What comes to mind when you think about it? So, yeah, avoiding waste, optimization, five S's, just in time. Just in time is a good one. The others are good ones as well, but just in time is kind of as if you read our slides. <laughs> We're going to keep this going, so if you want to join, uh, we'll give you later a, a link of what we have seen together. So, um, let me push the right button. Um, <laughs> so the stuff that we want to talk about today is basically connected to the House of Lean. Um, so there's several uh, depictions of this one out there, and we want to kind of lean on the original one from Teichi Ono's book in the English translation. And what we found is uh, that there are some, for us at least, misconceptions today how they're used. So we're going to go through the translations a little bit and go through the lean concepts and give you a little bit of story about this stuff. And we already heard the left one uh, just in time, uh, which is one that a lot of people look at. And we kind of want to start with uh, the one that's called customer-driven. So. When we take a look at customer-driven, uh, it's about the idea that we see a lot of times now is that 
we focus on that customer. So we want to do the best thing for that customer. We currently have that problem for our individual customer. But in the sense of Lean, it's not what it's about. It's more about the focus on the customers. So what is actually the demand out there? So how frequently do they actually want something from us? So how do we actually deliver to them? What are the capabilities that we need to be able to give them what they want? And it's more about the delivery reliability than about pampering single customers. And that's a typical misconception that we see out there sometimes. And if you look at the lean world, world when they um, talk about working in the customer's rhythm, they use this tact. That's actually the word they use uh, in English as well. And they change the customer tact from 38 seconds to 32 seconds by analyzing the demand. And believe me, it's not the real customer tact. There are not people lining up in front of the store to enter it every 32 seconds. It's just the mathematical requirement of what's needed by the market. So that's quite a lot more of economics and mathematics implied there than just pleasing the people. So what this is about going like from the idea of customer driven more to the customer's rhythm. Um, and this is kind of like one of those things that we kind of want to change from the usual misconception. So the next one is the pull principle. And that's, that's a real great one. I don't know how many people I, I met over the course of the years who really wanted to fight for the full poor principle in one way or the other. And there are many conceptions about what the poor principle entails, and none of them are wrong, but some of them are more towards lean and some of them are more towards something else. If we could have the Slido, please. Oh, the Slido, wait. <laughs> I'm too... So, you have next to. one. Exactly. So, so, what's the pull principle? What? Got it. <laughs> what is your primary idea when you hear that we're talking about the pull principle? Work is selected by the people who will work on it themselves and the state of the system determines when work is started. Well, I, I like both answers. Uh, and actually no one was voting for the Canadians to do it. But if we look into what the lean people thought about the poll principle, it was actually a little bit of the second and not the first one. So. You all might remember the last two years where we had these restrictions on how many people go into a store. And we had a pull system implemented there, and the pull signal were the empty shopping carts. And I have never seen an empty shopping cart come out of the shop, look at the line, and say, well, you know what, I want to work on you. There was a system in place, and the system actually created the pull. So that is not what happened. What happened, if we look at it more like we do at the workplace, was that uh, we had all these things... Uh, well, sorry, I got <laughs> ahead of myself. This is what does not happen in the shop variation, but what happens quite often in companies. Something gets done, and since we want to have a pull system, uh, Someone said, that's what I like to do. I like to work on this. It's my choice. But actually, that's not what the pull system is. The pull system means that there's a system in place that creates pull. And as soon as some work item leaves the system, and therefore we have fewer things in that stage of, of work um, than we want to have there. In this case, we want to have four After that piece leaves, we only have three. That creates a pull. And that is most often, as in the, in the shop variant, it's first in, first out. But you can have all other kinds of system. But it's something that happens systematically. And that, of course, 
translates through each of the columns so that just pulling something out at the end of the system is a pull that goes through the whole system and ends up at I the like, very beginning. I like to call them more like a suction system, but <laughs> suck systems is kind of stupid because a lot of systems suck, so yeah, maybe not a good choice <laughs> of words. <laughs> so, and for, for the Kanbanistas amongst us, uh, a lot of Kanban coaches also started to rephrase it from whip limits to whip targets because we want actually a system that is determining how much we work on at what time. So it, instead of this pull principle, let's call it a pull system to really make clear that it's a systematic property and not a personal choice here. Which brings us uh, to the next one, uh, and that's one piece flow. Uh, a lot of people kind of know about this one, and some people really love it. And we have another slide for that one, right? One piece flow. So what is the thing that you understand when we say one piece flow? What is your understanding of that term? We, we have a couple of options. For example, it might be you have a whip limit of one. And this is anonymous, so you can just go ahead and, you know, whatever you understand, we will not judge you. I mean, we might, but not personally. Hmm? It's closed. Oh. How did that happen? Well, we, since we're not online, we have an alternative. Just shout it out. What's a pull system from your point of view? Anybody? Any takers for any of the options? Anyone? Anyone brave enough to say something? Oh, now it works. Oh, yeah. Batch size nice. one. Thank you. Doing all the work on one item in one go. And batch size one. Those are the two most popular options here. Oh, sorry. Fuck. It's actually your slide. Ah. <laughs> and the whip target one is coming. And batch size one is winning. Nice. Oh, work item idle time zero. So, most favorite one is uh, batch item size equals one. Um, when you take a look at uh, the translation from the Japanese, it's basically the, just those three words and kind of. I, I'm I, I no means an expert in Japanese, but from my understanding, it was like it was the word one piece and flow kind of there, and it happened to end up in this setup. But it could have kind of been like this one too, flow piece one, or anything in between. So basically, the idea is, okay, which one, I mean, how do we, and what do we end up with? But if you kind of read the, the book, or if you try to understand what's actually happening, we get to this one. We want to have every piece in one flow. So what does it actually mean? Um, basically, it means doing things in one go. It's kind of like being on a slide and you know you just want to go from top to bottom in one go. I mean, some of you maybe know this, you know, these other kind of slides, you know, where you're like lots of people on there, it's just no fun. Or the ones, you know, where you stop in the middle and then you have to go like, <laughs> and then you can go again. So it's more about, you know, being able to do something in one go. Um, as you can see, there's, it does not mean the batch size of one, because if you have enough capacity in your system that actually like multiple people can go here at the same time, that's one thing. Or if you look at this uh, on the right-hand side, there's two people that can actually slide very closely uh, next to each other. It will still be working in the system, and they will all be having fun. So uh, it's not about overvaluing this batch size of one thing, because that's the dependency on your system. What is the system about? And it's more about uh, designing your systems in a way that you can actually go in one go. That is the thing that you kind of want to have. You want to have no idle time in the stuff that you create. So creating our systems for that and actually making slides that allow us to slide in one go, that's kind of important. And one of the things that we find is the most interesting one is when you look at passive columns in your, in your where is the idle time of the stuff, the work that you're doing in your systems. So taking care of that one um, is, for me personally, one of the biggest possibilities out there. Yeah. 
And lots of you have probably boards where they have columns that are called something like ready for or done in a column in the middle of the board. Those are the stops on the slide. So it's probably a good idea to visualize them and to count how much things are there uh, to enable this flow in one go for each piece of work. So this basically concludes uh, the left-hand side. We see a lot of those being used in the world out there, but uh, some of them are you know, well misunderstood, in our opinion. Uh, but there's uh, another one. Yeah, we have the, the right-hand side, which is uh, by far not as often misunderstood, because it's far more often just ignored. That might have to do a little bit with the name, because Ditoka is not exactly a term that's common in German or English or any other language I'm, I'm using on an everyday basis. Uh, and if you type it in, you get a really nice translation. If you type it into Google Translate, for example, it says the right translation for Ditoka is automation. So what's automation? Actually, that word just exists because of uh, Taichi Ono, and it's a um, portmanteau between automation and autonomy. So it means automate to create autonomy, to create agency, to enable people, to give them more efficacy. So this whole Jituka means just automate, not to, to control or do something to the people, but to enable people. So, the Jidoka automation part uh, leads us directly into one of those two things in that pillar. And this is uh, one of the translation was separate man and product. And when you look at this one, um, this is basically about... Oh, there it is. Nice. Um, uh, what you see, it's about mastering stuff, one part of it. But you have two different kinds of mastery, like the left-hand side, that's, you know, I want to be the master of. So basically, you rule over stuff. That's, like, really cool. And in this case, you better not roll, rule over people, but you rule over your tools. So you are actually the master of the tools. And there's the other side of it, to master stuff, as mastering your craft. So be really good at that stuff that you do. Be really good at using those tools. So it's about mastery and to master your tools. Um, in reality, we a lot of times see this stuff. You know, we just picked our favorite, um, I mean, my favorite tool is my, my arch enemy, uh, enemy uh, Jira. But, but it's not the only one. The same holds true for Slack, Outlook, you name it. It doesn't even have to be something where you move post-its. So, so basically, it's like in, in a lot of cases, Jira rules over us. So we kind of want to, you know, we have uh, something how we want to work, and then there's this Jira thingy that, you know, kind of tells us what to do. Yeah, uh, that is not so nice. So what we actually would like to have is more the direction of this one. You know, Jira should be our servant. I mean, I know that's not politically correct in a lot of senses, but in this case, yeah, it's true. We want it to do what we want it to do because, you know, it's our tool. Uh, so we want to rule over it. Uh, it needs to be helpful, so we need to have power over it. So actually, in a lot of scenarios, we see that you cannot change stuff. And this is, for, for example, uh, build pipelines are one of those things that I really enjoy most. You know, It's like people have their stuff that gets being built, and there's this one person, the high priestess, that knows how to change stuff in the build process, or when something goes wrong. That's the one you need to take. So that's kind of like the same thing. You're being ruled by your process instead of ruling your process. So learn how to do that stuff. Know how that works so that everybody can actually, you know, do something with it. So this one uh, is basically not about separating man and machine. It's about separate the work of humans from the work of the machines. And the other one that's on the right-hand pillar is that built-in quality. And... Built-in quality is something that is really important if you have cars, right? No, it's not. It's not the product where the quality is built in. But when you talk about lean, it's the built-in quality into the process. 
So that all started with uh, this automatic loom. If you know about the Toyota history, um, they had an electric loom that automatically stopped if anything went wrong to prevent uh, misproduction. And so they could run many more looms without caring about anything going wrong because it's, if everything went wrong, that was handled very, very quickly and efficiently without creating damaged goods. And nowadays, this is all with, um, even done with whole production lines where you can stop the whole line as soon as something goes wrong. Um, how does that translate into every day's work? Um, if we were in the knowledge work, we don't have a production line we can stop. So what do we do there? Well, first of all, it's important to really differentiate between common cause variations and uh, special cause variations. Because what we want to do in the... If, if the uh, thread is at the end in the loom, that's not a special cause. It's just a common cause. You plan for that, you handle it. But if something goes wrong, that's what you want to correct. That's where you want to get better. And we have the same if we drive to, to, um, to work every day and uh, there's a tree on the, uh, on the road. That's probably a special cause. We have to do something special. If we just have a red traffic light, that's just a common cause and we can plan around it, uh, put it in our process very easily. So for your processes, the idea is to really find out, okay, what is a special case? What's blocking us that we didn't expect? And, well, all of these tools nowadays have a way to put blockers somewhere, but that's not the really important part. The really important part is the other half. Really go there and talk about them, evaluate them, and do that often so that you can improve your processes and get better. And in some cases, that also may, might mean that you want to introduce a kind of end in court in your work as well. For example, if something doesn't build anymore, it's probably a good idea to wait a little bit without uh, implementing new features because something might have been changed so fundamentally that your new features won't work anymore anyway. So it's recognize the deviations uh, and stop. Because sometimes you turn those special cases into common cases because you find out, oh shit, they happen more often than we recognized. And when you look at all those things, like uh, the automation part and uh, the idea of Kaizen, and we're not going to go into that one because that's going to take much longer, uh, you come to the idea of the visual management and the Genshi Genbutsu. And if we look at the visual management, it's that thing that helps us to actually see those things, to make it transparent. We have things like uh, this, this uh, end board visualization, where you can actually see stuff in real time that's happening, and this gives us information where we want to go. Or you have a visualization like these Kanbans to have an idea about the production, how much capacity do we have, what do we need. That, that's how Kanbans actually kind of, that, that's what they are. Um, what they were in the 50s. Yeah. And when you look at what we see today, we see a lot of visualizations. Um, but uh, a lot of those are kind of not what they seem to be. So it's like working agreements that are hidden in some kind of folder, in some confluence document, and that, you know, wither along, you know, they, they just die there. Um, it's about the, the ticket system uh, that we could look at. You know, we know it's there. We might even know where it is, but we haven't seen it in a while. Um, it's about those statistics that we have. We have awesome statistics about the stuff that lie on the team lead's desk. Nobody well, ever sees them. Nobody ever looks at them. So this is not the stuff of visualization that we're actually talking about. Um, when we talk about this visual management, is the, the unfortunate thing about this is uh, you can't from the outside really see if a visualization is a visualization in the visual management sense. Because what you need to observe as well is the interaction. Because it's the visualization with the interaction that's happening. It's about how do we use that to actually do something. And we know a lot of uh, things where this actually goes wrong quite a lot, as you probably know, like dashboards that wither. Um, and that brings us to the so, second so, part. Sorry for switching the slide. I was looking at the wrong yeah. display. <laughs> yeah. So. Genshi Genbutsu. Genshi Genbutsu. Another nice one. 
Genji Genbutsu is uh, the place where it, the real thing at the real place. That's a, another nice one. Um, go to the place where it happens. And we already had that one. Visualize at the place where it counts, where things happen. Don't have it somewhere far off. And if you combine that with really discussing the work where it happens instead of at the manager's office, really going to the place where the problem is, you, know, you, give, you get to the, to the real basics of the whole Genji Genbutsu and Gemba Walk idea um, to really make sure that you look at the situation, where the situation happens, to go there in um, Japan, in, uh, the, in Toyota, it's forbidden for managers to call the employees uh, to, to have them report. They have to go to the place of work and really discuss it there. It makes a whole lot of a difference and the same is true for today's work. And you might know this name, the, the Gemba Walk, where you actually go to the place where it happens. Uh, funny thing there, if you look into Japanese language, the Gemba is also the crime scene, or the Tatort in German. And uh, this is, once again, something that we really have in, the, um, in this notion of go there. You can't solve a crime without at least having seen the real place. You have to be there. Really good advice for architects, by the way. You know, you know the ivory tower thing? If you go there and see and actually work with people who actually program, can be really helpful. And they even industrialized that and called some, uh, built something called the Toyota Cutter on that, uh, where it's the manager's job. I don't want to go into this really short four-step uh, process, which my brother described in 439 slides. Maybe it's not such a simple four-step process. Um, but that's how the process development is handled in a lean context. The people who actually do the work define the processes and they develop the processes and they continue to build on it. And it's the manager's job to coach them to help them achieve their goals. And they don't do that at the manager's office. They do that on site where it really happens uh, at the crime scene. And one of those things that I find really interesting about that stuff is when we think about evolutionary progress, it's not just iterative. It can be revolutionary changes as well. So we can evolve like in different ways. It's not only just the tiny steps. Okay, where are we? Oh yeah, the gives roof. Us, gives a, come, brings us back to the roof. So uh, basically when we take a look at this stuff, um, it's the, the roof was translated as highest quality, lowest cost, shortest lead time. But there never was the, when you look at it, just you don't see the connection. And uh, there is a connection. So when you look at it, it's about quality and lead time. And that stuff results in our cost. What it's really about when you look at how uh, Teichi Ono was working that one, it's about the sustenance, uh, uh, the subs uh, subsistence of things. So how do we actually live with that? So it's about that stuff that uh, brings the, takes uh, the quality that we deliver and our care for the customer's rhythm into what we have as stuff that makes our lives better. So in this case, uh, the crafting quality is essential. It's about our craftsmanship. It's about uh, not making shit, like not botching around. So that's one of the essentials in this craftsman's view. And crafting is not only you know, like software crafters. Crafting can be anything. You can craft a plan, you can craft a design, you can craft a proposal, you can craft an article. It's really about being in the sense of the good craftsperson who really takes pride in their work and knows their craft by heart. Be really good at what you do. And this additionally means, like, if you're a manager or a leader somehow, uh, that you kind of have to understand what that stuff is about. It's not just that you can look from the outside, but you have to understand the inner workings of that stuff. You don't have to be able to do it yourself, but understand what it's about. Otherwise, yeah, it's kind of a waste of time. So, 
what does this quality mean? It's um, my future self should never ever tell me, oh, why did you do it that way? So if I know that nope. future me will be angry at me for doing it like that, I probably shouldn't do that. Nobody of you knows that kind of feeling, right? <laughs> and Marie Fuhrer Kaspari actually had a nice term for that. In, uh, in the German version, it's uh, nichts soll für die Katze sein. And funnily enough, we can say that in English with a different animal, it's nothing should be for the birds. And that kind of brings us uh, to the lead time. And when you look at the lead time, it's not about you know buying stuff and selling it, like buying low, selling high. That's the merchant's kind of view. But for us, it's about, like in the lean sense, it's about the stuff in between. So we have something, and then we use that stuff to create things. We make something out of it. And that stuff in between that comes to the customer, if we get excellent at that one, that is when we get the benefit. It's about being better in how we do it. Huh? So, Falk mentioned this term already. When we see cost in today's lean literature, it's translated from a more complex Japanese term, and Taichi Ono is talking there about uh, subsistence. It's about making not only ends meet, but really making the stuff we do create the, the potential for more things to do, like whatever is necessary to build more, to, to get through next years, and so on. Uh, important side note here is the subtitle of, of the original uh, book is Aiming for Management Beyond Economy of Scale, if you translate it directly from the Japanese. So it's all about, it's not economies of scale, it's really making a living by what we do, by what we create. So this kind of concludes our run through the house of lean in, in terms. And this is kind of where we go ahead and think about, yeah, basically we think the automation part is kind of too much neglected. Uh, the thinking about the waste is kind of like we think about, you know, reducing waste in the kind of wrong way. It's more about how do I not waste my, my valuable lifetime when I do stuff so that I feel it was worth doing something. So it's more about those things. And, uh, oh, yeah, no, no. you want the Slido, right? Yes. Yeah, I always forget <laughs> about the Slidos. Uh, so we have another question. Um, is it this one? No, it's showing Q&A. You Let's should... See. So, which opportunities for improvement uh, could you notice uh, at the Gamba tomorrow? Uh, once you start looking at your, I don't know, Scrum, Safe, XP, Agile, whatever you do, doesn't matter, uh, implementation when you look through it with a lean lens. So, if you just take the things we talked about, the two pillars. If you have an idea what you kind of want to look at or what you found interesting. Maybe you look at your own implementation of some processes you have and you might find... Or if you just had another 40 minutes nice nap, that could be two too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that one. Thank you for this yes, one. Yes, whoever it was, thanks for more work on the pipeline by everybody. So many people do even not know how to build their product while they're even working on it. Interesting. Anything else? You can also just shout it out. Just saw three people typing. One more typing. We have <laughs> one participant is typing. Hey, I like technology. <laughs> three participants are typing. No big brother here at all. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> You're not being watched. <laughs> Shall we just go ahead? Because oh, I, I think you can also shout it out. If you want to. But typing is more fun, right? But typing is more fun. We'll look at it later yeah. and would just like to use the last three and a half minutes for answers. Yep. To there questions. Are some, yeah, there, are, there are some questions, uh, but they're in two different places. Uh, so how, how can you be on the crime scene in a remote scenario? Well, 
being at the crime scene in knowledge work doesn't always necessarily mean go there physically, you know, especially when we talk about stuff in the knowledge work that is not working, we very often see people who talk about the problem, who are not really working on the problem, just getting reports about what's really happening without looking at the material they're talking about. And especially in knowledge work, it's quite easy to really say, okay, uh, let's do a screen share, let's really look at the problem at hand that you're talking about. And for me, that personally means if I'm working some kind as an architect or uh, as a person that wants to like go into that, go to the people, that are, like actually have a conversation with them in their realm, looking at their code, asking their questions, actually being there instead of just telling them what you think is right and they just have to listen. There's another question about remote settings. Do you have examples for visualizing things when they're seen in a remote work setting? Come again? The, I didn't like, get So you, if you're in a remote work setting, how do you do the visualization? Do you have examples for that? Oh, yeah. Yes, we do. And <laughs> actually, we dropped that slide, unfortunately. <laughs> now, unfortunately. Um, this... Uh, if you have logon screens, you can put visualization on the logon screens. If you have uh, some kind of board that you talk about when you talk about the work, you can have the statistics on that board as well. So that it's not some separate place you have to go to, but you just put it in the place where people go anyway. On the start page of the, um, what's it called? Uh, the meal plan, for example, if you have a uh, current number of user errors, end user errors, or end user complaints on the uh, meal menu on the top of the page. It's hard to miss. Uh, I have one really nice story about that, what I, what I really liked but didn't happen. It was like uh, an organization that uh, we've been working with. Um, they introduced the concept of the end court, and seeing an end court is not easy. And so during some hackathon, uh, a group of people, you know, created these small devices that you can just build with a, a small microcontroller. And I would actually, you can just set it next to your computer on a desktop at your home, like building that, it's not really hard to do. And then whenever that stuff goes off, you can see it. It's like a visualization right at your home in a remote work environment. That was a really awesome idea. Didn't make it completely, though, no, unfortunately. unfortunately, not many of those devices were produced. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll take time for one more question, the last one. How is a pull system or process-driven building quality different from letting a process rule over you? Can you say that again? How is a pull system or process-driven building quality different from letting a process rule over you? I don't personally understand. Oh yeah, the question, I, I get that. You do. Yeah. The, do you want? Okay, I'll, I'll take that again. Sorry. Um, the the huge difference is what you see at this um, at this crime scene slide. It is not a predefined process. You define the process, and you means everyone working in the system, every day of of your life or every day of your working life at least. You, know, you don't take a prescribed process and be ruled by it, but quite the other way around. That's the whole idea of automation and Jitoka, that actually you are the master of your process. You might have some things uh, in place to make sure that you agree on the process, but it's the people who do the work who are in charge of the process. So it's actually turning it around completely. That's kind of in Scrum, you know, the retrospective, that people kind of, you know, they kind of do stuff, but they actually rarely look at their own process and actually change it. So we a lot of times complain what we don't change it so that it's better for us. That's a really great point, actually, where, where to go and, there, where it's built in. And that's, again, where it, where it comes into place um, that uh, you need to be master of your tools as well, because if you have your process in, uh, in your tool, and you as a team are not able to work with a tool to change the process, you're not the master of your process. So it really all ties together. And I think with that, as last words, we'll thank you very much for the talk. Thank, thank you. you.